Brenda Hirschmer is the owner of Grassroots Enterprises, a community development consulting company, and an emerging tech startup called Campus for Community. Her primary work has involved community building and comprehensive community transfer transformation and the change process and leadership it requires. She specializes in community development, strategic planning, and community leadership, recently serving as the director of Alberta Recreation and Parks Association's Eight Communities Initiative. Brenda has taught in the rec field at Niagara College and worked for the city of Niagara Falls, Brock University, and the Niagara Falls Boys and Girls Club. Brenda is a blogger, author of three books, has been nominated for several awards, and she was acknowledged as a YWCA Woman of Distinction in Training and Education. As you can see, Brenda is very well qualified to speak on today's topic, and I know you're going to enjoy her presentation style. So I'll hand it over to Brenda now. Hi, everyone. This is Brenda Hirschmer, and thank you, Agnes. That was a, a lovely introduction. Did, I, did, I'm feeling a little pressure now, though. So just to kind of put this all in perspective, the, the last time um, someone introduced me, they, they were referring to that award as a, uh, from the YWCA. And instead of introducing me as a woman of distinction, she introduced me as a woman of dysfunction. And sometimes I think that's probably a more accurate description. So thank you for that. And thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank uh, uh, Lynn and Agnes and their board of directors for this opportunity to share. And uh, you know, I really do hope that there are others among us who will want to um, volunteer to share their respective learnings. Because I truly believe that we've got an awful lot to learn from one another. And it's so exciting to see that Lynn and this technology platform gives us that opportunity to share with one another. So um, as we get started, I just want to point out a couple of things. One is that in the bottom right-hand corner, you will see a copy of the, the handouts that you can download so that you'll have copies of all of these slides. Uh, and I, I just want to warn you ahead of time that there is a lot of information on the slides that's very deliberate because what I was really trying to do was to provide you uh, with a lot of resources. So if you want to download that, you can. And if not, um, uh, Jennifer is going to send it out afterwards as well. So you'll have copies of the slides for those of you who like to have uh, a record. Um, the other thing that I should mention is that the webinar is being recorded. And we're doing that so that we can share this with those who may not have been able to attend. So thank you to all of you for showing up. My guess is that um, I'm speaking to a lot of early adopters. So I'm pretty excited about that because I think it's those, you are the ones who will be excited about the topic and whether or not we can be the best we can be. So as we go, I hope that you will use the, the chat um, to add ongoing comments, and then a lot of you have already started to use the chat, so I can see you're familiar with that over on the right-hand side there. Um, the, the, I'll try to keep an eye on it, but if, uh, if I miss something, and uh, sometimes, some days I'm much better at multitasking, so if I miss you, don't hesitate to, uh, to go up to the header bar and put your hand up again and just kind of poke at me to make sure that uh, I've paid, paid attention. Um, and just so that uh, uh, just so that there's recognition, sometimes it's just easier to speak up rather than write. And so again, I would just ask that you put your hand up and unmute your phone uh, to speak. And you can do that. The traditional way is to use star six to unmute your phone. Uh, they, that, that's, there's a bit of a challenge with that sometimes because we hear that click, and everyone will hear the click when you unmute. But so if you're up to it, so just go up to that header bar and click on that old-fashioned headset. Uh, and you can um, you can unmute your phone that way as well. So any questions so far? We're good. We're good. Okay. All right. So we're going to move to the the first slide and just share with you what what I hope that you walk away with at the end of this session, uh, because I, I I get that a lot of you are able to do this already, but I hope that there's some information here that will help you uh, strengthen your capacity to communicate the power and possibilities of our field, because. I, I've never been prouder to be part of this field, and I just think there's, there's so many opportunities for our field if we take advantage of them now. The, the timing is ours. Uh, and, and, and share with you some priorities for how we can best position our field at the local level as well as the broader national level. And as I mentioned, I, what I really want to do is share, share a lot of resources with you 
And, I, you know, I'm really privileged because while my roots are in Ontario, um, I've been here in Alberta for about six years now, and I've also had the, you know, the privilege of working with a number of other recreation and parks organizations across the country. So I, I've been a collector of, uh, of information. And so, you know, I really want to stress up front that I'm, I'm, I'm probably not a definitive authority on any of what I'm going to share, but, but what I want to share, what I want to reflect is a lot of what I've heard in the community building work that I've been doing across the country from a lot of really smart people like yourself. And what I was motivated to do and what Lynn was receptive to was, was being able to share this information in this webinar. So for me, it's, and the reason why there's a cartoon of a guy with puzzle pieces here is that, is that what I wanted to do was provide a picture on top of the puzzle box. Because I've become more aware that many of us have some or you know, a few of the pieces of the puzzle, but we don't have all of the pieces of the puzzle. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm also that's what I wanted to share, and I also I'm also guessing that uh, that that a lot of you on this webinar today will have some of the other missing pieces of the puzzle. So I'm look for looking forward to hearing more from you about that as well. So I'm going to cover a lot of ground. There's a lot of slides. There's a lot of information on them. And, but hopefully that will prove valuable for you. And I'm also, I also would really invite and welcome you to, to, to tell me whether or not you agree or disagree. I don't know that there's anything terribly controversial in terms of what I'm sharing, but uh, I just want to make sure we got it right. There's, there's probably a lot of other things happening that we're not aware of. So just before we jump into this, um, what I also thought I wanted to do was share with you the, the, the roots of this session and how it came to be. Because it, it happened as a result of a conversation, as a lot of really good things do happen. You know, when we take the time to have those deep and meaningful conversations. I had one last year with, with a young guy, um, but astute, executive director of Saskatchewan Association of Recreation Professionals. His name is Dan Gallagher. And what we were doing was talking about a number of potential workshops that I could deliver at their provincial conference. And... He was struggling a bit, and what he was struggling to explain, he was, trying to, he was struggling to explain what he was looking for. But ultimately, what surfaced was that he thought that we as a field, that we just might be too tied up in managing our facilities and our programs and our services. Not that that's not important, but what he said is that he sensed, uh, like a lot of us, I think, that while those were important, our facilities and our programs and our services, there was more that we should or could be doing in our communities. And he really felt, and the, the title for this session came from him, he really felt that we weren't being the best we could be. And, and that really got me thinking, uh, you know, what is it going to take to be the best we can be? And, and so I started thinking about um, what, what, why I came to this field in the first place. And so that's where I wanted to, to start to I'm going to ask Jennifer to switch to another layout. So I would like to get some input from you. Uh, and the input really is to have you answer, answer the question, wh what attracted you to the field of recreation and parks? What was it about this as a field? Why do, I mean, some of you may have happened by accident, but you're still here. So what was it about that, uh, our field? Yeah, I can see you starting to type. Good. Yep. I can just see that you're typing. I can't see what you're typing. I don't see what you type until you hit enter. So you can revise as you go and then hit enter, and then we'll see it. There. There we go. So we shot. You know, that's really fun. I think that probably the fun thing is probably something that does uh, distinguish our sector. I, I often think that I've often heard it's referred to as being the fun factor in the room. Yep. And the variety. Isn't that true, Renee? It's such an eclectic field, and I don't know about you, but I don't know that I've ever really been bored. And for, for sure, helping people, serving the community, giving back to the community, the people component, Roy, yes, absolutely. It truly is the, the hub of the community, and, and you're in the business of fun. What a great way of, of putting that, yes. Yeah, and connecting with community in a, in a, in a meaningful way, yeah. Uh, working with people, working with community, yeah, and you know, Carrie, I think you're right. It's a sector that people can get excited about. It's, it's something that everyone can relate to. Uh, and isn't that important? Yeah, absolutely. Community connections, positive impact, making a difference. Yeah, that's great, Sarah. Good. 
Anyone else? Yeah, for some I think it may take a, a bit more uh, reflection in terms of, for some of us it may be going back a few years in terms of, in terms of why we came to the, to the field. Okay, well let's, okay, Jennifer, let's go back. And thank, thank you, Jennifer. Just in, just, I, don't, I don't know that we formally introduced Jennifer Pelche from Lynn and uh, also from Pro, but um, Jennifer is for sure, I'm not talking to myself, there really is a real Jennifer. She's the woman behind the curtain and, and definitely has always been grace under fire, <laughs> especially when there's technical challenges as there were today with the phone. So thank you, Jennifer. So that's what I wanted to, to just really get us to think about what, what it was that brought us to the field in, in the first place. And I, I think for many of you, it was because we, and as we saw, it was really because we wanted to make a difference. And I think probably what's kept us in the field is that, you know, that, that we learned that recreation and parks really is what helps people grow and be healthy. We can impact families. We can impact communities. We can protect the environment. We can, we can stimulate the economy. We, we're definitely impacting the quality of life. And so, you know, that's all, that's all really important. And, and for sure, programs, facilities, and parks are, are a key part of that. But I think we still need to be asking, you know, what more can we do as community builders to, to partner and collaborate and, and innovate in this? It's a, it's a crazy world. It's an increasingly complicated world. You know, and are we, you know, are, are we more than bricks and mortar? And that was the question that we kept asking ourselves in this conversation. You know, are we just about our, our buildings and our programs? Or are we something more than that? Can we be the mortar between the bricks? of our community, that, that connects our communities. And, and I would say, yeah, absolutely. And for sure, that's what's kept me in the field. Um, but I would also say we need to do more to, to legitimize community building and plant our flag, because I don't know that there's ever been a better time um, to, to be a community builder. Uh, and, I, and I don't know that there is anybody better than recreation and parks practitioners to be community builders. And, and I can say that now um, with, with some authority because I've been working with a lot of other sectors. And, and, man, they don't get what we do. And they don't understand community the way we do and, all, and, and it's, you know, from a systemic level. And, you know, so this, is, this understanding of community and being the mortar that connects uh, others in the community is going to become increasingly important. And, and it is a larger result because of the kind of world that we're living in right now. And in the world, there, there's major shifts happening everywhere. So if you feel that things aren't working well in parks and recreation, don't feel alone because it, this is happening everywhere, and not only in your community but around the world. And the, these shifts are happening that we're, we're, in essence, preparing for a world that doesn't yet exist. But the shifts that, you know, we're kind of moving from, we, and people are quite often and understand that we are moving from an industrial economy to a knowledge economy, but we're, we're all now moving to an emerging molecular economy or what some are calling the organic economy. And you know, one of the things that futurists, the only thing I think they agree on these days is that they can't predict anymore. The change is too rapid. What they do agree on is that these five major shifts are happening, that we're moving from systems that are about hierarchies to being more about networks and webs, that things aren't fixed anymore. They, you think they are changing now, it's going to get even faster. We can't predict anymore. Everything is emerging. Everything is transforming. It can't just be about reforming and fixing things. We have to transform our systems and the way we think about the work that we do. Things aren't linear anymore. You know, it's not, you know, I think the industrial era is about, was about kind of about, about pieces. And the future has to be about um, an entire system, and it has to be much more holistic in nature. And, and if we're going to be the best we can be in this world, it's also going to take a different kind of, of leadership. So what we're, what we're seeing is a, a shift. And I know for many, and probably many like you, who are early adopters and, and, uh, and maybe working in traditional settings, there are a lot of frustrations because a lot of what is still in existence is what is on the left, on the left side. And what we really need to do is shift more to a, to a role as community leaders. So it's, you know, we're not just reacting to symptoms, that we're, you know, we're going into the root causes, that we're not, you know, we're not just looking at 
top-down solutions, one-size-fits-all, cookie-cutter kind of answers. We, can do, we, we need to do things more from the bottom up. And I, I've also used this expression, middle out. It was an expression I learned from one of my students last week, um, and I thought it was brilliant because it's really, I don't know that it's an either-or anymore. And I think that recreation practitioners, uh, many may be at the, the top level, many may be at the grassroots level, but our real value is working middle out somewhere in between so we can influence the, the, those at the top and we can influence and, and be knowledgeable because of what's happening at the grassroots level. So this middle out role is going to be really important. Okay. Um, that, you know, it can't just be about sometimes gathering input from, from, from citizens and stakeholders. It's got to be always. Um, and I think, I think unfortunately, sometimes we work in systems where you have to prove the importance first before we will put resources and time into an issue. Instead, we need to shift to empowering stakeholders. We can't just share on an a information on an as-needed basis. We, we need to openly share information and knowledge. And thank you, Joe. I just noticed your, your, your points there um, about nature parks, outdoor recreation, that, yeah, we, can, we do, with that, turn the dial of the quality of life higher. Absolutely. So we need this different kind of leadership where we share power, where we collaborate and brainstorm so we don't always stick to the or org chart. It's about a flat hierarchy and collaborating. And it's not just about reviewing staff and volunteer performance on an annual basis. It's about immediate and ongoing feedback and coaching. And it's not. And I think this is probably the most important point on these slides is that you know, the kind of leadership that we need to see that, and I'm guessing a lot of you are already demonstrating, is that you know, real leaders don't develop followers. They develop other leaders. And I've got to tell you, that's probably what attracts me more to our field than anything else, is that we are in this unique position of being in, able to influence others. And I know even from my own personal experience, I would not have been in this field if it wasn't for the director of, of Recreation and Parks at the city of Niagara Falls, a guy named Bob Sones, who saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. And so he totally impacted my life. And, and that's one of the, you know, it was a great role model for me because I think, wow, we have this amazing, amazing opportunity to do that. So we need these kinds of, of leaders, uh, and we need to shift. But it's a little chaotic right now, and so we just have to, I think, understand that. And once you understand that, I think it's easier to deal with. Um, but having said that, you know, now, you know, having looked at the future now, what, what is also interesting to me is that in many ways, I think we, and I'm really not the kind of person who looks back. And yet, in some ways, it, it's almost as if we need to go back to our future, as a, our, our field, the field of recreation and parks. We need to go back in some way. So I thought it was really important to kind of just take a quick look at our roots. You know, it's interesting that many of you talk about wanting to make a difference, because that was clearly um, at the roots of our field. And our field really only uh, emerged in the, in the late 1800s, and that's because at the time, and think about that in terms of timing. At that point, we were shifting from an industrial economy uh, sorry, from a, an agricultural economy to an industrial economy, so that we were dealing with significant social issues as people moved from the rural areas into the urban centers. And so, uh, again, when there is upheaval in society, just as there is now, um, significant social issues started to emerge, and so recreation was really viewed as a solution. And in that time period, uh, and, and during this upheaval um, is when a lot of our organizations started to form, the, the YMCA's, YWCA's, Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, the youth groups, the service clubs, the parks, the playgrounds. They all surfaced to deal with social issues. And so those were our roots, that whole, you know, the, the whole way of working with citizens to, to deal with, you know, and it was a lot of different things at that point. It was um, dealing with new cultures as a result of immigration, you know, the people moving from rural to the urban areas, as I mentioned, uh, a rise in, in what was then called juvenile delinquency. And, in, and they were dealing with social issues like drinking and gambling and prostitution, right? So all these issues, and, and, and not in, a lot of them, in some ways, what we're dealing with right now. And so recreation was really seen as a tool for addressing uh, community problems and issues. And so that's why we can learn from wh wh why we evolved as a profession. So 
we evolved to really address citizen building and community building, but we, we shifted um, a little bit, a lot of bit actually, um, to, to more of an era of public recreation and parks. And this happened after World War I and World War II, and we became much more activity centered. So the emphasis on this human development, the development of human potentials, kind of declined. And I love the way that um, Tim Burton uh, framed this. And I'm going to talk about each of these just really briefly. But if you want to know more, Tim Burton is a retired professor from University of Alberta and has been very, very active with Alberta Recreation and Parks Association. Um, but he talked about these different eras, this input, the inputs era, the outputs era, and the benefits era. Uh, and, and I think there's a, indicators of, a, of, of what I'm referring to more as a community era. But this, you know, by understanding this, I think you, we can understand what, what we're up against right now. So when you think about the inputs era, so this was during the 60s and the, and the 70s. The economy was strong, the population was growing after the war, and a lot of this growth in our field was attributed to what after the post-war? The post-war what? Anybody want a game? Take a guess. I can see some people typing. Yeah, you got it, Joe. Absolutely correct. Yeah, this post-war baby boomer. So it impacted our field because all of a sudden there was this this quick growth in the numbers of municipal departments. Oh, what expanded? What, what expanded? Not, you know, not just the municipal departments, but what else did we start to offer? What expanded? You're probably still running a lot of them. Good, yeah. Yep, yep, you got it, Mamie. It's programs. Yeah, the programs, and a lot of them were educational in, in nature. You're right, Odette. And certainly, it certainly impacted schools as well, because there's this massive growth input of, of these boomers. And then at the time, we also built a lot of what? Yeah, you got it. We built a lot of facilities. So there was no doubt um, that public recreation, public recreation services were deemed as being essential and unquestioned. Um, I can, I can uh, refer to this in terms of even in, in our own family. Um, my grandfather was very involved in lawn bowling, of all things, um, and then somehow ended up getting elected and served as the chair of the Recreation Commission for the city of St. Catharines, which is where I was raised. Uh, and he was part of the commission that hired the very first recreation director uh, in St. Catharines. His name was Bob Christie. And that was, in the, that was definitely in the 60s. So this massive growth, and it was just to deal with all these, these kids. Um, we built a lot of the facilities to celebrate what? Do you know? Do you remember? Anybody around during the 60s? Something big happened in the 60s. 1967 specifically. You got it. Yeah, it was a centennial. I think a lot of us have facilities that had the word centennial in them, Canada's 100th birthday, yep. So we, we kind of, we shifted a little bit. We kind of didn't, we started working not just with kids, but um, with all age groups, both genders, persons with special needs. We added a lot of staff. We hired external consultants in a lot of cases and they to develop. Do you remember, do you know what we did a lot of that we're not doing anymore? External consult, what did we hire external consultants to do? I'll give you a clue. It's a kind of planning, but it's a very, oh, very good. You got it. You guys are so smart. Yeah, definitely the planning piece. Um, a lot of master plans as well as other kinds of plans, um, as Judy points out. Yeah. Um, so, and so what we were using was a specific approach. So we kind of shifted from more of the community development approach that was at our roots. We shifted to a different approach to service delivery. Anybody? Yeah, direct programming, absolutely. Direct programming, we used a social planning approach where, you know, as a profession, we saw ourselves as the, uh, as the experts, and we were the ones that decided what programs to run and how to run them. So we really shifted away from empowering the community um, to running programs and facilities. And so by the late 70s, there was a lot of concerns about, uh, about the future. 
And, and a lot of that was because of this, this shift that had happened. And what happened, and I think it was actually in 1978, yeah, um, in Ontario. So Ontario really led the, the pack in terms of really ad addressing this issue. Um, that, the, and they, they ended up in a, in a retreat that discussed and resulted in the Allura prescription. And in their list of readings that Agnes shared at the, at the beginning and will share at the end, um, there is a, the Allura prescription, and thank goodness for Lynn, because we have a wonderful archive of all of these resources. There is a copy of the Allura um, prescription. And as a field, what we agreed on is that, that we can't control, we can't continue to guide and control participants, that the system was kind of bankrupt, um, and that the, the main recommendation that came from all of this is that we needed to shift. We needed to shift from being providers of services to becoming community developers, facilitators, you know, rather than programmers, and enablers of recreation. Now think about it. That was in, that was in 1978. Um, we, we didn't do it. And that, that's part of why this is, it's important to take a, look, a, a quick look back, because we didn't do it. Because something happened in the, in the early years of the 1980s, a major recession. So all of a sudden, our budgets were being, were being slashed. There was dramatic increases in a specific kind of cost that really impacted our field. Do you know what? Do you remember, or do you know, or do you remember your parents maybe talking about what happened in the early 80s? What raised dramatically? What cost? Yes, you're very informed, Joe. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. It was it was the energy cost, the price of oil, and so all of a sudden there's this major shift. We were we were suddenly being questioned, at the, part in part because we had made this shift. Um, and so there was this focus on the financial bottom line. I just gave that one away. Yeah, triple bottom line. But it wasn't so much the triple bottom line. I wish it had been more of that. It was really the, the fiscal bottom line. It was all about the money. And so uh, we, we shifted to providing um, these, these services. And instead, really, we kind of became more of a business, which is the third bullet point. We came, became a business offering products and services. And I, as a result of that, we just became less relevant to the field. So and what, what started to arise, and we still hear rumblings about this, is that there was this sense that, that recreation and parks really could be better delivered by what sector? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, the private sector, the business sector. That's really what the, the thinking was, that, that you know, we, we, because we had shifted this relevance from really looking holistically at communities and um, helping to develop people, we had become less and less relevant. So what ended up happening um, was the benefits era. And this is what, what Tim Burton calls the, the benefits era. And this emerged in the early 1990s. Um, this is when I was um, involved with the field. And I, I came in at a time, and I can't, still can't believe I got a, a job, at a time when everything was being cut back. Our field was declining in, in credibility. We, we found it difficult to articulate our value. And there, there was this sense that we needed to do, we needed to do more to articulate our, our value. And that, what that led to, or, or, and, and the missing blank there, I guess I should say, is what? I should ask you that. Because this evidence, we needed evidence or indicators, and sometimes it was called indicators, benchmarks, or there's actually two correct answers, I'd say, here. But so take your pick. Yeah, it, we, it, absolutely, Carol, you're, you're right. We did refer to them as benefits. A lot, others referred to them as outcomes. So there was this, sh this shift that needed to happen. And this was, this was the beginning of the benefits movement. And, 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 and our potential that, we, that parks and recreation could have in terms of impacting health and quality of life and civic engagement and community le leadership and, and innovation and youth resiliency and lifelong learning, it really, you know, it, it really got us back to thinking about you know, what is it we do? So what? You know, when they threatened to cut back our services, how did you fight back? You know, so we ran programs and facilities. So what? 
And so that's what we were trying to do, was answer this question of, so what? So what? So there was this, this beginning, this thinking that, well, let's go into the research. And it's really interesting because uh, in Canada, we dove into the research to prove that we were creating value, whereas in the United States, they just started marketing. They had this great national marketing campaign called The Benefits Are Endless. It wasn't grounded in any research, and I think kind of spoke to the difference between Canadians and Americans, and obviously we needed both. But what the Canadians did was, was dive into the research as their response to all these cutbacks and, and collected, started to collect evidence or of these benefits or these outcomes that we could deliver. So it wasn't just thinking about the process and, and, and the how-to of delivering programs and facilities. It was more about what we had the potential to deliver. And this led to the very first benefits catalog. And in, you know, my understanding of this, and uh, I, was, I think I was still in, in university at the time when I was first introduced to uh, the benefits catalog, the first benefits catalog at a, at a conference. Uh, it, was, it was kind of built off the work of Dr. Driver in the US. He wrote a book called The Benefits of Leisure. Um, but the, the idea actually evolved, as a lot of good ideas evolved, on the back of a napkin. And the, the story is that it did evolve in a bar after, at a conference, uh, the, this idea, and these four specific ca uh, categories of benefits, personal, social, economic, environmental, they came out of that, that, that meeting in a bar uh, on the back of a napkin. And there were people like Ken Balmer that was in, involved and still involved in our field, and uh, John McIntyre, and Larry Catchison from Pro was, I think, part of that, and um, uh, Doris Haste, we knew her at the time, who, who is now um, Gabby Hawes, who's on the board of Lynn, and even Russ Kispe from Participation was really supportive. So that was the first benefits, benefits catalog. And if you have a copy of this in your office, um, on your office bookshelf. Can you put up your hand? Can you go put that little guy, that little uh, androgynous guy up on your header and put up your hand if you have a copy of that? I'm just curious. Yeah, some of you do. It's still kicking around. Look at that. Yep. Yep. Well, that's how it came to be. And uh, it was immediately seen as, um, as a valuable resource. In fact, it happened so quickly that it was again um, updated in 1997. This is when I ended up getting involved. And we kind of shifted a little bit from those four categories and came up with um, uh, a number of different marketing themes and different benefits statements. So this benefits catalog. Anybody have a copy of this one on their, um, in their office library? You still use it? Yeah, you still got it. Some of you got it. Yep. I know, actually, the thing that's very interesting, I was, I was involved by this. And again, Ken Balmer uh, from Rethink and Brenda Clark from Rethink were the drivers behind all of the benefits catalogs. And really, as consultants, were, did a lot of the work in terms of putting it together. I was really honored to have been um, the editor of this particular one. But the thing that I found most interesting is that by, by the book selling standard, this was a Canadian bestseller. It actually sold uh, not only across the country, but uh, around the world as well. We did a lot of presentations in other countries um, to share what it was we were doing. So it, it was revolutionary at the time. It's the basis of our, our field, and yet there's so many people who still don't understand this. I'm surprised at the number of young people in the field who've never even seen the benefits catalog. So it, it did. So it did kind of stagnate for a while uh, until, until just recently, in, in uh, 2011. Uh, actually, it started a little bit earlier than that. But w we were in the, the fortunate position in Alberta uh, of having access to dollars that may not have been accessed by other parts of the country. And this was in large part because of a thriving economy based on the, uh, on the oil industry. And so we had this project called ACE Communities that, that ended up with uh, an amazing and astounding $6 million. And so among other things, we had, we had funding available. And I think it just speaks to our sector. It shows what we can do when we have some, we have some funding. And so we, we had some funding that allowed us, and, uh, and they had this amazing team that came up with the idea of moving benefits from a, a printed catalog that would soon become out of date to moving it online. 
And even though the funding for this came from Alberta, it was always, always done on behalf of the entire sector. And so when it was put online, uh, and that, was, that, that made it really exciting because there were so many advantages to that, uh, it, and it, its home became Lynn. And thank goodness for, for Lynn because they've just done a fabulous job of maintaining and growing it. And it, it obviously needs all of our support. I know even now when I find uh, a piece of research that speaks to the benefits, um, it's really easy to upload it and continue to grow it. So it's a responsibility, I think, for, for all of us to continue to, to use and grow that. That's what it looks like. It's at Benefits Hub, and I'm guessing a lot of you um, know about it and have been involved. I know Janet Fletcher from um, Alberta was really involved with the benefits movement over the years. And there are probably a number of other of you as well. So uh, it, it is really a significant uh, foundational piece for our sector, pretty, pretty core, and has lots of uses. It is something really big. I don't know that we've used it as well as we should, but I can tell you any other profession that, w that are aware of this, whether it's social services or health, they don't have this. And they're so envious of what it is we've been able to put together. So again, I would just just want to encourage you to to be aware of that and to use it because we're at the same point again. This is today's reality, and this actually is a, a graphic that came from Ken Balmer, some result the result of some work that some trends work that he did just recently um, called rethinking leisure services. Um, but this is really where our field is at. So. I'm sure you have, you've seen evidence of some of this in, in your communities. Does this look familiar? Yep. Yeah. So we've got some challenges. We're kind of where we were um, you know, and when we missed the opportunity last time. So the field is changing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to point you to this resource about the game changers in our field about our, why we need to rethink leisure services and not miss this opportunity again. And Ken Balmer, who is also, he was involved from the beginning with the Allura prescription, is still involved. This is, this, he came up with these five game changers. Um, I've included a link here. You can actually buy this. Um, it, it's really a mini, uh, mini book that provides more information about what he calls as these game changers. You can also see, um, a lot of these, it, you can buy the book, it's $5.99 at this link. Um, but you can also see a, a lot of these same things that he's written about in a paper that he wrote for the National Recreation Summit. And it, that's on the link of resources from this webinar that you can access. So I just wanted you to point you to that. If you need some ammunition to say we need to change in our community, uh, or, or, or we need to change our priorities and how we do things, then this is a really good book to, to learn more about that. So that's a you know that's a quick and dirty of where where we've been where why we need to change you know, and the, so the question remains now how do we become like what do we do with this and how do we you know how do we become the best that we can be so and, and this work kind of this work evolved and this was part of a conversation with a lot of really smart people like you um, an amazing team that I worked with here in, in Alberta as well others of you across the country we've had conversations with you know we were really trying to think you know, how, how do we position our field you know whether it's at a you know at our community level our organizational level or um, across the country how, how do we position at a, mi a micro and a macro level? What is it we need to focus on as a field? You know, how do, you know, what work do we need to do to be the best that we can be? And so this is what it really evolved to. And I'm going to talk about each of these briefly and then and share with you resources for each of these. But what it really comes down to is what, what we saw as a need to do four things. And I, and I think while four things, sound, it's, it's doable, absolutely. Uh, it's not it's not going to be easy. My guess is a lot of you are doing this already. I think as early adopters especially tend to do a lot of these things intuitively. Um, so you're, you may be doing a lot of these. This, this is just a framework to help you put it uh, into perspective. Uh, the, the first priority for our field at any level is vision. Uh, and being really committed to ensuring that what we're doing is community relevant, that it's results or benefits driven, 
and that we as a field are, are, are value-based. And that's where sometimes we've, we've lost our way a bit. Um, the second thing that, that became really loud and clear is that, you know, there's a whole different set of leadership skills needed for, um, for our field, for our individual practitioners. B community building and serving as an agent of change is very different from running programs and facilities. A lot of the same elements, but it, there is a different set of competencies. So the second thing we need to do is really invest in the capacity, the individual capacity of our practitioners. And by practitioners, I, I use that word more uh, a, a lot because for me, practitioners is inclusive of, of elected officials, of volunteers, um, and of paid staff as well. But what we need to do is really strive for this enhanced professionalism and capacity to respond to what's happening around us. And it's unfortunate, but I think one of the first things we do with, when there's a budget cut, what's the first thing we cut? I see you typing. Yeah, and yeah, so, soft services, the staff. And what's, what's one of the things that we do for staff that we cut? What do we cut first? What line is that under staff? Yeah, yeah, Trish, thank you. Here's that that's a, seems to be like one of the first things we cut is training. And isn't that crazy? Because at a t there's never been a more important time to invest in professional development and training. And so we've got to make a case for that. And part of the case is understanding, and that's why I went into the history part, is to understand why, why, we, have, why we have to change our, our, our competency set. Because we can't just be direct programmers. We have to be community developers, community builders. And it's a different set of skills. So second thing here, focus on the individual capacity of us as practitioners. The third thing then is, is, is not just the individuals, but you know, if we have this vision, we have strong practitioners, what about our organization? You know, what, what about the capacity of our organization? Um, are we committed to exceptional service delivery? And, and how are we doing? How are our organizations doing? So that's the third thing. And then the fourth thing is, is really this community building, the strategies and the action that's going to support these three priorities. How do we get to that? Okay, so can I just have a hands up if, uh, I, I, if you're okay with it? Does this make sense? Or in the chat, if you have any questions, feel free to answer them now. And I'll just stop and take a breath and wait to hear from you. Okay, so hands up, making sense? Good, thank you. Any questions? Good, okay, lots of hands, thank you. I know. I, I, I'm ho actually, it's probably a good thing if there aren't questions. And I know when, I, when, when we present this, it looks pretty simple, but the reality of this is that it's taken a long time to kind of sort it out. Again, this is the picture on the top of the puzzle box. You know, this is, if we're going to deliver the benefits of recreation, if we're going to deliver that vision, we've got to have all of these elements in place. Okay, so the thing about the vision piece is it is about, you know, it's about the outcomes, it's about the benefits, it's about paying attention to community trends and issues, and it's about promoting recreation as a solution. And John Crompton um, says this a lot. He, he says what we really need to do is provide recreation as a solution to what's already I in the, the, uh, the heads of the elected officials in terms of what the community issues are. So we've got to promote recreation as that solution. So the good thing is that we're not starting from scratch. There's visions around that we've worked on. And uh, as a field, I think that speaks to what we have done really well. There was a vision in 1997 that came out of the, the benefits catalog. That vision is still floating around and was discussed in New Brunswick at the, um, the summit this summer. Um, there's another one that evolved um, out of the National Recreation Summit. And, uh, and I don't know if everyone knows about the, the Recreation Summit, but it, but it was really the first recreation summit since 1987. I, I don't know what that says about our field, too. We were definitely dragging our heels there. I don't know what that says about the leadership, but we didn't have a national summit between 1987 and 2011, so we had some work to do. But out of that came this new, ver this new draft vision. How many of you
you have seen this vision? Can you put your hand up if you have seen this one? Some of you have. Good. Now, some of you may have been at the, the summit. Now, some of you were. Okay. And I, I think as you, as you can see, and the reason I'm sharing this with you, and this, this, may, um, this is relevant to our entire field, but I think there's a really important verbiage there that you can bring down to your organizational and your community level. And I think it's really important because it speaks to this broader potential of our field. You know, it really shows the role that we can play in contributing to the growth of individuals as well as the community and the, the issues that are there. Now, I've got to tell you, tell you, there's still wordsmithing being done on this. Um, it, wa it, was dis it, you know, it has been discussed and will continue to be discussed, but I think the essence of it is there. There are positioning statements that I think you will want to take a look at. And these positions, the, 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 the follow-up to the summit that was held in Lake Louise and Alberta in 2011 came this past summer in Fredericton, New Brunswick in, in June. How many of you, were any of you there? Hoping somebody was there. Because um, one of the other things it did, oh good, some of you were there, good. So feel free to jump in at any point, Debbie, if I've missed anything. I wasn't there, um, and so I'm relying on the, um, uh, on the printed reports and, and conversations with others. But feel free to jump in. That would be great. Okay, Jennifer, can you help um, uh, uh, Susan? OK. That's why we're really happy to have Jennifer with us. Okay, hopefully, is everybody else okay with the slides? Okay, no, no, it's good. It's good, Susan, don't worry. I'm, I'm glad you spoke up because we wouldn't know you're having technical challenges otherwise. Oh, so, okay. So more of us are having issues. Hey, Jennifer, any, any thoughts? Oh, Brenda. Perfect. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah, it should be fixed. I think yeah. there was just uh, an incident with the syncing. Okay. But we are now in positioning strategy, vision. You're just going back now? Yep, got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That happens. That happens. Thanks for your, your patience. You know, I think sometimes we, we forget that this is happening on the Internet. And uh, lots of quirky things happen there. So thanks for your patience with that. Um, and I just, just wanted to share this because these are three positioning statements that came from, from New Brunswick in, in the discussion. And I think they're really key for all of us to take back to our respective organizations and to our communities, that we must be outcome driven. We must be inclusive in every way, and we need to be relevant and compelling. Um, they're, they're, um, they're still, again, still wordsmithing. Um, there still is, um, um, there's still uh, some changes happening. Like, for instance, even with the three cornerstones, um, there, there really, there's still some uh, challenges with the wordsmithing. One of the big discussions was whether or not economic sustainability should be a cornerstone of our work. I truly believe that it is. I, I'm seeing so much evidence of the fact that when the quality of life is good in a community, that that leads to economic development. Um, so, but there was some, some questions about that. So still being wordsmithed, but, but really key and critical um, to our field. So. So even though, you know, I'm not sure that people really agreed necessarily with the, the phrase citizen building, but everyone agreed with that as a role of what we should be doing, you know, investing in people, growing people, supporting people, um, in, engaging them in our communities. And so um, uh, it's still really, really key being wordsmith, but, but still really solid. Okay. Um, any other um any other thoughts, and Debbie, you especially, because you were there. Any other thoughts about what happened, your, your sense of what happened with that vision that evolved from Lake Louise and from New Brunswick? Oh, and I realized I just put you on the spot, didn't I? <laughs> if you want to unmute and speak, if that's easier, or if you just want to ignore me, that's okay, too. I'm good with that. I can see you typing, though. Okay. Well, the, I'll, I'll take you to the next slide because I think this is really a, a really critical one as well. Um, yeah, 
Good, Debbie. That's, see, that's, that's really encouraging, isn't it, to know that what's come out of that summit and, uh, and the follow-up in New Brunswick is that it, to, to know that it is informing our local and the provincial work. That's really critical. Um, because these are, the, these are, and again, these are being wordsmithed, being summarized, being grouped, organized in different ways. But this is really what came out of the summit itself in terms of our priorities. And so, as you can see, it doesn't really say much about running facilities or programs. Uh, what it talks about are, are really being more inclusive um, for those, um, you know, for, for those from different cultures, from those who can't pay, from working with citizens. It talks about community building and advocating for healthy public policies. And I, I mean, are you are you doing that? And that's the thing that that we really we really need to be thinking more about. Um, you know, I, I think we. If we don't focus on these, we're never going to shift from recreation being seen as nice to have versus um, it being a need to have. And that's the shift we need to make. We want to shift to be the best we can be. We've got to move from recreation, you know, it's a nice to have. We've got to move it to being seen as a need to have, as an essential service. And the way we're going to get there is to focus on these priorities. You know, one of the things, too, um, I mean, there's some really, you know, it really, helped focus, I think, the summit on public policies in terms of the role of recreation in health and poverty reduction in the early years and economic development, uh, after school care, um, neighborhood renewal, all of that. It just, it really, it really demonstrated and a lot of the, you know, the acknowledgement of the potential of our field didn't even come from people in our field. Uh, at the summit, there was a lot of people from our, you know, our, our sister fields you know, whether it was health or economic development or social services or justice, they are the ones that told us how important we were. And, uh, and, and really, in a lot of ways, were telling us to get out of our offices and get into the, get into the community. Um, so, so that was really important. They really were talking about our potential. But we've got some big issues, too, and some of that surfaced in the summit. You know, one of the statistics that really surprised me was that um, volunteering for culture and recreation organizations had dropped and we, we normally engage so many volunteers in sports and recreation, but volunteering for culture and recreation organizations had dropped 19.5% um, across Canada, among, especially among 25 to 35-year-olds. So you know, overall, volunteering in Canada has remained stable, but we're losing our volunteers. So we really, you know, that's the kind of thing we've got to focus on. But I think one of the most poignant things that I heard from the, the summit um, there was a, a group of uh, young people coming into the field, uh, university, college students, or, you know, and a lot of them were involved uh, in the summit as scribes. And at the end of the conference, they were asked to come forward and talk about uh, what their opinions of the field. And, you know, they were so excited about our field and what we had the potential to do. And one of the phrases that just caught everyone and, and, uh, it, and was very emotional, because what, what they actually said, and I'll read this part, it said, they said, if recreation were a ship and you were on that ship to build a strong mast to weather a storm, our message to you would be this. We want to set sail with you. We aren't afraid of the storm. You know, and, and that's the kind of caliber of young recreation professionals we, coming, we have coming into our field. And, and we need them, and they need us. And so, you know, that came out of the summit as well. So a lot of really good things in terms of where we should be placing our energies. So, you know, having shared with you all, all of that, um, I'm going to take you to another chat right now. And, and ha have you, actually, what we're going to do is go to a whiteboard. Um, and I want you to share some of the trends and issues that you're seeing in your community not just recreation trends. I, I really, I, I'm hoping you can step back from that and think about what's happening in your community. You know, what, what's keeping people up at night? What are they worried about? So Jennifer, can you switch to the whiteboard and then I'll explain that. Um, the one thing we want to say uh, from the get-go is don't, don't click on anything in that, the top header because uh, you have the capacity because, well, anyways, it's a long story, but just don't do that. <laughs> so this is a whiteboard. Um, what you need to do is to, is to take your mouse and, and click first on the T for text, 
and then put your cursor anywhere on that whiteboard. And then you can start typing in your trend. This is kind of fun way of getting input from you. Um, if you're feeling adventurous and creative, um, you can click on not just the T, but you can click on the pencil and do this freehand. Okay, so try that. Ah, and we have we have a trend already. Lack of volunteers. Good. Ooh, seniors feeling isolated. Good. Yeah, yeah. Job loss. Yes. Oh, we lost the screen, Jennifer. Oh, there we go. We're back. I think somebody must have stopped, hit the stop sharing budget, uh, stop sharing button. Because if you click on that, you wipe out everyone else's text. So if, if you don't mind, just try it one more time because we wiped out a couple of comments there. So click on the T and then anywhere on the whiteboard and you can start typing. Good, yep. Anybody want to get creative? Try the pencil? Do it freehand. Woo woo. It's kind of fun. There. Oh, there we go. I always like it when somebody is uh, somebody's brave enough to try that. I'm just going to move a couple of these around because we overlap a little bit. No big deal. We'll just move that. Actually, Jennifer, can you help with that? I'm not very good at it. I'm trying to move some. There we go. Youth. Nice. Money. New part. Oh, nice. Good. Now you're rocking. Jennifer, can you just help um, with some of those overlaps? Kind of spread them around a bit so we can see what people have typed. So what are, what are the things that your, you know, that your politicians are making a priority? You know, what are um, issues that you've heard from other sectors that are our priority? That's the kind of thing we need to be thinking about. Yeah, it's like transportation, job loss, aging population, housing costs, yes. Yeah. Yeah, immigration is a real issue, isn't it? Yeah. Roads, you know, transportation is always an issue. Roads are always an issue, yeah. Good. This is a knowledgeable group. Oh, we wiped you out. Somebody, somebody clicked on that button. Oh, we're back. Okay. So I'll just give you another couple of minutes to add any others. Oh, we still got a bit of duplication there, but or overlap. I meant. Sorry. Move some of those around. Yep. Oop! I just lost the whiteboard. Hopefully. You didn't as well, but it looks like you might have. And we're back to the whiteboard, I think, or to the. Hi, Brenda. It's Jennifer. Uh, it's okay. So, so just a quick reminder um, to just uh, stay on the whiteboard because you all have um, special presenter status, which allows you to kind of. Um, Rejig things around, so um, you're, which you're, could be fun, but it can also delay us a little bit. So that's okay. We can, Jennifer, we can move back to the PowerPoint presentation. Perfect. But what I do know is that you're very knowledgeable as a group about what's happening in your communities, and that's what we need to tap into. So the power, the whiteboard was <laughs> was fun. So you all had more power than you knew you did. So, but thank you, thank you. Oh, now we're We've got to go back a bit. Somehow the slides got a little bit out of order. So, and I'm not going to go through all these slides because it's clear that you know what's happening in your um, in your communities. But what I have for you um, are trends for consideration, and this is a summary that that I've been collecting and working on for um, quite some time, and I keep updating it as as I learn about other trends in these communities. But uh, but I've shared these ne next couple of slides because. They, they are all issues um, that we as recreation practitioners, we need to be seen as a solution for. And so 
Um, some of these may or may not be relevant in your community, but I think it's a really good place to start in terms of thinking about what you are doing differently and how you can and should be responding in a way that's meaningful and relevant to what people really um, are concerned about and what we're seeing as trends in the communities. So these are in alphabetical order, and there are um, about... Uh, I think five or six slides. And I think you mentioned a lot of these um, in, in, on that whiteboard, but this is just really a summary that you can refer to. So I'm going to stop here and then ask you to, to go to a chat as well. We've talked about vision. We've talked about trends. And so here's the question. How does your organizational vision measure up? And this is anonymous, so you can be really honest here. That's why we did this as a, a large chat. So go up to the top and type your answer um, where it says type your answer here. How, how are you doing? Like how is your organizational department or vision, a vision measuring up? How are you doing? Can you all see this screen? Hopefully. There we go. OK. Good. So some of you, good. So some of you, uh, you're, you're on track. Well, you know, if nothing else, isn't that a good thing to know that you've got this first element in place? You've got the right vision. Good. Good. And, you know, some I'm not surprised. I think the kind of people who would be attracted to this webinar in the first place probably are working within organizations and influencing organizations and their communities um, to be in line with what we see as, as the priorities for our vision. So good. Some of, you know, some of us, I know we always have work to do. I know we generally find people are doing 80% of the right things, so we just encourage them to work on that other 20%. So, yeah, and some, I appreciate your honesty. Look, so, so, that's being honest, um, being, being slow to respond. That's being very honest, being slow to respond to community changes, and I think in many ways we are. Large part, it's, you know, part, part it's because we have, you know, we're working for bureaucracies that are kind of slow, to turn around, they can't always be nimble and entrepreneur. So yeah, so we could do better. Good, and I appreciate that honesty because it is—it's hard to get buy-in because it's all about change. But at least it's clear, I think, and hopefully it's clear now in terms of where we need to go as a field, what the vision can and should be, the kind of trends that we need to respond to. Okay. So Jennifer, do you mind taking us back to the uh, to the classroom and to the PowerPoint? Okay. Thank you for sharing. And I appreciate your, uh, your uh, openness and your honesty in terms of answering those questions. And I just left you with a couple of quotes here to deal, that deal with vision. One is um, from Peter Drucker, which I love. I never predict. I just look out the window and see what is visible but not yet seen. And I, and I love this one from, from, the, from the book called Age of the Unthinkable because I think it explains why a lot of us are uh, struggling um, because – it, because it, this is a difficult time. It's a revolutionary time. And, and it, 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 in many ways, we are entering a revolutionary age with ideas, leaders, and institutions that are better suited for a world that no longer exists. That's our, that's our challenge. That is our challenge. So I'm going to talk about the second area um, in terms of individual capacity of practitioners. Now, I don't know if I have got my finger on the pulse of everything that's happening, um, but I'm going to share with you what I know and uh, what's been done and what is being done. And uh, I would encourage any of you, if you know of other things that are happening, I'd really appreciate it. Oh, we lost a few, uh, a few letters on our slide here. Not sure why that happened. But um, the second strat positioning strategy is really about investing in our practitioners. So investing in not only in our staff, but our elected officials and our volunteers and citizens in terms of their capacity. So. You know, that does mean for us as a field, we need to invest in more professional development. We need to, um, to really connect to our post-secondary uh, institutions, our colleges and universities to make sure they're relevant. I know here in, in Alberta, we've, we lost one of the best recreation programs in the country, uh, and we can't afford to let that happen. Uh, we've got to do more in terms of career awareness. There's a lot of talk about potential certification. Uh, but a lot of this really focuses on, and what I wanted to talk most about was this whole idea of competencies. Because, because with competencies, 
a, uh, it, it, we really have a, we have to have a framework for what we're doing professional development and post secondary education for like what what is it you need to have uh, as your competencies to come into the field your your skills your knowledge and, and your attitudes and it's important to to wrap your head around this because um, we're, we're, we're guessing. Someone said this to me the other day. They're guessing about the kind of conference sessions that, that are important. They're guessing about the kind of webinars. Um, they're, they're not sure about certification and what you'd be certified for. Um, but if you have a framework of competencies for the work that we do, um, then you're eliminating a lot of the guesswork for where you should be investing your time and your energy. And so competencies are really... Um, it, it, it is difficult to get there once you figure it out. It, it's in many ways, it's a, a competency is like an outcome because it's a it's a culminating demonstration of 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 learning and achievement. So it's a combination of skills and knowledge and attitudes, and that's why it is a challenge. But there has again, there's been some work done, and this is the thing that I find a bit frustrating because a lot of people don't know what has been done already. So. Uh, in Ontario, what there is, and I've included the link to this, uh, and I think this is brilliant on the part of the, the Ministry of Training and Post-Secondary in uh, the Ontario government, uh, because a number of years ago, they developed programs, started developing program standards for clusters of programs. And so, and I know you can't see this, which is why I've given you the link, but what's really interesting about this is that you know, there, there's 22 different recreation uh, and leisure service programs in, in community colleges in Ontario. And what the, the ministry and what the government decided was that there had to be a minimum requirement. So when graduates came out of a recreation program, they needed entry-level skills for our field that were consistent. And so I, um, I was really lucky because I was teaching recreation at the time, and uh, I was seconded to the ministry for a year um, and helped develop the first program standard, and it's been um, updated since then. So, but even when they updated it, there weren't a lot, of, uh, there weren't a lot of, cha of changes. But what they figured out, this is why this is really important. They're saying to each of us, this is what we should come into our field with. When we come out of college or university, well, this, in this case it's colleges, but it, uh, it's not a, uh, I think it's very in line with what you should have as a university graduate too. Um, the, there's 12 competencies. So after two years of training, this is what you should have. There's 12 competencies. Each of these competencies has um, different indicators to explain more about what it's about. Um, I really uh, like these. I think they're very practical, but I think they can, they're, they reflect the generic nature. Um, someone at the beginning of this call was talking about uh, how much variety there is in our job. And I think these, um, these competencies reflected in this program standard. So take a, take a look at this because uh, I think this can show you where we need to invest professional development uh, and training if staff come into our field. And some people come into our field without a degree or diploma in recreation, so we need to take a look at that. So um, you, you can, you'll have that link, and I would encourage you to take a look at that. So what that ended up then happening is, and uh, I, again, I, just, I was really lucky because I went from uh, Ontario, um, I left Niagara College, I went to uh, Alberta to ARPA for this exciting work that was being done, and again, we had some funding. So we thought, what well, we need competencies in, uh, in Alberta for recreation practitioners. And we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we worked off those ones that were uh, from Ontario. We looked at a lot of others that had started to be developed across the country. Um, there was some work, a little bit of work that was done in BC, a little bit of work that was done in the Northwest Territories. Um, but we ended up with core competencies, and if you look at the ones on the left, they're very similar to what came out of Ontario. Um, so there's competencies in, uh, in 12 different areas. Again, this just doesn't... It just doesn't paint the full picture because each of those has, has uh, different indicators. But I think one of the things that was really cool is that, and, and, and I'm hoping you can relate to this, is that in, um, in Alberta, in the conversations that we had with practitioners, you know, they were fine with this entry-level piece, 
But what, in, in large part because what they said is that, uh, and I love one of the examples that came from one of the participants. Um, what, 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 what he said was that, you know, if we were physicians, uh, we wouldn't necessarily be the specialists, you know, a specialist in gerontology or internal medicine. Uh, we were the GPs. We were the general practitioners. And so you know, that's one of the reasons why um, we're, we're in a really good place in terms of this chaotic world that we're evolving into because we are eclectic, because we are generalists. We know a little bit about a lot of different things at the entry level. So, the, you know, this, these competencies, you know, even when I was working at the ministry, the competencies for recreation were different from social services or health. Or we, were, we were much more generic, and I think but that's why there's great value in what we do. So we were the GPs, but there was this, this really neat tangent that happened in the conversation with practitioners like you, um, because what they said was, you know, what, what's happened is that our, as our career matures, we need a different kind of competencies. We, we take on this more advanced community leadership role in our communities, and it's a different set of competencies. And so if you can see these here, it's more about the community building work. It's about being an agent of change and, and being committed to continuous improvement in how you do that. It's about system thinking. It's about advocating for quality of life. It's about planning using a community development approach. So, you know, quite different, um, but really essential, not only for our field, but many other fields as well. And this is where I know that where uh, I've been placing a lot of energy, and certainly the amazing team from ACE Communities at ARPA, that's where they place their energies as well. Because what became clear is that if we're going to deliver those benefits that we've articulated in our vision, we've got to have both. We've got to have our core skills, and we've got to have these advanced community leadership skills. Okay. So um, these are the actual, the six, shown in a different way. Uh, what ARPA has done since then, and this is work that's being done right now, they've shifted the competencies little bit, and they are now articulated as 19. Um, they, the categories are, well, they have five different categories. And the CEO of uh, ARPA is part of the CPRA committee uh, that is working on, uh, on the consideration of professional development and certification program that will be based on these competencies. So that work is being done. And in the list of readings, there are a link. There's a link to those competencies as well. Okay. So, any questions about that before? Okay. Can't stress the importance enough of those competencies if we're going to build our our, our capacity uh, as practitioners. The whole idea is to move us from being managers to being futurists, to be transformational leaders. And that's why we've got, a, we've got to get a, can, a handle on the competencies and invest in that training and learning and sharing. I mean, so much of this is about learning from each other. Okay, so how are you doing in terms of, 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 of supporting the development of practitioners? How are you doing? Do you have work to do? Doing, are you doing anything? We'd love to know if you're doing things that are exciting or different. Or I should also, oh, I also just meant to mention about, I think Saskatchewan was doing some work on competencies. I'm not sure where they're at with that, too. But I know that Saskatchewan was doing some work. I don't know if any, any, of, uh, any of you involved with provincial, your provincial association, are they working on competencies as well? I'm not sure. So how are you doing in terms of supporting the development of practitioners? How are you doing? Or perhaps you're still thinking about that because I'm not seeing answers. OK. Oh, I can see a few of you typing now. You're typing in, in the chat. Well, let's just move on. We'll just go back to the PowerPoint. I think it's really an important question for reflection in terms of you know, how can we 
you know, how can we do more to support practitioners? Okay, so last I just want to talk quickly, because I'm cognizant of the time, I want to talk quickly about our organizational capacity and how we need to focus on that as well. Just to make you aware of the work that I'm aware of that has been done, um, there is a program that, again, we were able to fund and start through ARPA and through ACE. Again, as always, always focused on doing this for the profession across the country. Just lucky that we had some funding to do it. Um, and, and really look at what constitutes service excellence. Like, How do we know our organizations have the capacity to deliver on these visions? So you know, we think about it. You know, we've got to have individual strengths, but you know, we, our organizations have to have capacity as well. And there's a lot that's starting to emerge. So uh, Rec Excel, Rec Metrics, Yardsticks. I'm just going to talk really quickly about that. And again, you've got the uh, the slides as a resource to come back to. But I wanted to talk about this service, the idea of a service excellence program, um, because uh, it's really you know when I first came into the to the field. Um, we we had standards, you know. We had standards that were, I don't, know, you know, they were things like the amount of acreage you had to have for parkland, the number of swimming pools you had to have for um, for X amount of pop of the population, and you know, they 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 kind of became ineffective and out, outdated, and so we kind of um, we 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 didn't really have any anything to measure by. Um, we really weren't sure and couldn't always tell um, how are we doing in terms of service excellence. So th the idea was that we needed to, to get into that. And again, we had, this, we had this funding. We had the brilliant Ken Balmer and Brenda Clark from Rethink and spent, I think, close to $100,000 to figure this out. So if you, you can see by this process, and I'm obviously not going to go through all of this, but I just wanted to show you what they went through to develop what is now called Rec Excel. Um, th this, amazing, this amazing tool uh, was a result of a lot of extensive research and testing. And is also now being um, rolled out and was tested in Saskatchewan through SPRA as well. That was, again, the intent was always to share it with other provinces. Um, so it's Rec Excel. Uh, and what it is, is to deter it's really designed to help determine what needs to be in place to ensure excellence in, in, in programs, in parks, facilities, in this important area of community building, as well as the leadership and management that cuts across those first four. Came down to core competencies in 10 different areas. It's not a benchmarking program. Uh, you know, a benchmarking program will tell you if you're being efficient, you, you know, whether or not you're running the most efficient arena in the country, but it might not tell you whether or not you should be running an arena in the first place. So you know, the excellence piece is more about the effectiveness in those 10 different areas. So a, a lot of that work has been done, and we don't want you to reinvent the wheel, so just know that it's out there. And I just wanted to close by, by really just stressing this importance of of community building and the, the strategies and action that evolve from that, because that's what's going to support the, the top three priorities there. And I think what I wanted to stress more than anything, and, and there's obviously a lot more training um, in the area of, of community development and community building. That's really where I've been putting my energy. Um, but, but really what's essential about that is understanding that community building can't just be something we do off the side of our desk. It has to be embraced as being an essential uh, core practice that we provide. And so we need to legitimize community building. Um, and we're using the term community building as opposed to community development in large part because people understand it. No matter how you interpret community building, you're going to be right. And not everyone understands community development the same way. So we use community building as a phrase instead. Um, I want to stress that from the work that, that we've been able to do, um, and now with some 60 plus communities across the country, I'll tell you, you, citizens in your community, they want to make a difference. There's real this, this hunger to give back. They want information. They want connections. They want feelings of belongings. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's so challenging. Um, but it's there. And the research is showing that. Even Ro Robert Putnam, in his book, Bowling Alone, 
His research shows that 75 to 80 percent of us, we believe that more emphasis should be placed on community, even if it puts more demands on us. And so, you're, you know, people are telling you they want you to be a community builder. They want you to be a catalyst for change. Ultimately, it's all about relationships, and, and that's what we do best. That's what we've done better than any other field I've ever been a part of. And that's why I can't stress that relationship building enough. Um, it's about getting us to, this, to the right-hand side of the spectrum. This is a great resource to show how about the different kinds of public participation. But as practitioners, we want to move this end of the spectrum to the, to the right-hand side, because we want to empower our public. Um, there's lots of things we learned along the way. Start with the early adopters. Find yourself a posse. Do something. Uh, call it a pilot. Um, someone at the national summit in one of the meetings I was in, she said, whatever you do, just call it a pilot, because then people don't ever get nervous about it. Do something, but call it a pilot, and people don't get n nervous. Because some really wonderful things happen in your communities when you shift this power. Um, there's some magical things that happen, and these are just some photographs of some communities that did some really wonderful things. I'm leaving you with this, clues for time of turmoil. I just think it's a really powerful way of, of it's almost a mantra for where we need to be as a field. And this slide for me is really, really critical. And, and this is really where um, I, what I want to leave you with is that you know, the titles don't matter anymore. Um, any one of you can lead the change. You know, maybe you can't change the whole country, but you can certainly change your, your corner of the country. And that's what I really want to encourage people to do. Um, and I really want you to leave uh, really thinking about what, what's at least one thing you can do uh, as a result of today's webinar. So I hope we've given you lots of resources to do that. Uh, I, I hope that you can take some of this. I know we're really busy. We have a lot of great intentions. But, but take at least one piece of this and try to do something different a new pilot, a new meeting, get out of the office, meet with people, tackle one of those challenges, and show people um, how important and how relevant the field of recreation and parks is.